Well, welcome, and uh, I'm sure you all realize that there can be a uh, few or no really branches of the law and practice in this country which are likely to be uh, as uh, dramatically affected by Brexit as the law of intellectual property. Uh, true that uh, the European Patent Convention doesn't require you to be a member of the European Union, uh, but the uh, agreement on the Unified uh, Patent Court, which was brought to birth after nearly uh, uh, half a century of gestation, uh, now is just about to take effect. It requires our uh, ratification, and there's a question as to whether it's going to be uh, ratified as a farewell gesture or whether it uh, is going to have to be uh, renegotiated between uh, the other members. Uh, the Unified Patent Court was just about to start here. The premises, I understand, were, were ready. Uh, it was going to be the place at which uh, the Central Court was going to decide questions of pharmaceutical patents and chemi chemical patents. That is an area in which London has been now for a long time, the, the, the centre of patent litigation. And uh, the question is, all of that is now uh, up for grabs. Uh, likewise, the whole of our trademark law is European law. What is going to happen to that? Uh, copyright, uh, not quite so European, and I don't think you're going to hear much about that tonight. But for the other topics, we have uh, a panel of five speakers, uh, each of whom is going to speak to you for 10 minutes. Uh, and then it's up to you. Uh, we're going to have a discussion in which all of you, we hope, will have an opportunity uh, to participate. So, first of all, uh, Morag MacDonald of Bird and Bird uh, is going to talk about the Unified Patent Court. Thank you. Um, the Unified Patents Court was actually going to be something quite new. Um, as that was the case, then I think a lot of people, a lot of companies would have been quite nervous about actually using it to begin with until it had been tried and tested. Um, it was going to have very, very new procedures, nothing like it before. And of course, it was going to be the first court in the world which was going to deal with civil claims on a cross-border basis, a multi multinational basis. Um, and the United Kingdom's vote to Brexit has actually put all of that in jeopardy. Now, some industries, and I suspect the life sciences one is, is, uh, is an industry uh, of this type, um, are quite pleased that uh, it may well not go ahead. Um, other industries were probably looking to uh, take the benefit um, at least of uh, the Unified Patents Court, if not the Unitary Patent, which would also have come into force at the same time. But now, uh, that is all thrown up in the air. And the reason for that is because whilst the Unitary Patent was going to come in as European Union legislation, the agreement creating the UPC was an international treaty. Um, just like the European Patent Convention, which presently exists, which is the convention which allows for the prosecution and granting of patents through the European Patent Office, um, and which actually handles uh, potentially patents for 38 countries, not just the 28 member states. And it's exactly the same for the UPCA, which was it was going to come in as a treaty, albeit it was only going to be a treaty which could be, a, 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 you could only be a member of that treaty if you were also a member of the European Union. Hence the reason why it's all been thrown up in the air, because if we cease to be a member of the European Union, we can no longer be part of the UPCA. That's the way it was drafted. And slightly more, um, to add to the complication, it had to be ratified by 13 member states before the treaty could come into effect, and so the UPC couldn't come into effect until then, mm -hmm. and three of those had to be France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. So this all throws up whether or not 
the United Kingdom should ratify. And immediately after the vote, there was a lot of discussion about this, and it was uh, very much urged upon the United Kingdom, and I'm sure that some of you in this room will remember this, um, that uh, we should ratify, um, and um, then somebody would sort something out um, so that when we cease to be an EU member uh, state, that nevertheless the United Kingdom could continue to uh, be uh, part of the UPC. Um, there were several problems with that which made it unattractive, uh, not least of which there were no guarantees that in that situation the UK's involvement, which was considerable in the UPC, would continue when we ceased to be a member state. Um, most notably, the involvement we were due to have was that we were due to have the, the Life Sciences and Chemicals Division of the Central Division. Now, that's not quite as important as it may first sound, because that is the division that would deal with um, revocation actions and uh, it, uh, declarations of, of non-infringement. Uh, the much more common infringement actions, which then have counterclaims for, for uh, invalidity, were, were to be dealt with by the local divisions uh, in the various different member states. But of course, the United Kingdom had one of the major local divisions lined up. Um, and the other involvement we had, which um, always amused me, uh, was that uh, we were in charge of the, um, the IT system. Um, and uh, that was quite important. Um, but most important because um, there were various fees that you needed to pay uh, before the system came into effect if you wanted to opt out your, your European patent from the system. And um, uh, that was done away with in the end, but you still needed to be able to register your opt-out. And at that point, um, the United Kingdom uh, was holding the database, which was to be transferred to uh, the UPC as soon as it came into effect, but could not actually be held by the UPC because it didn't exist. So, um, uh, so all of that has been um, sent into confusion. And the question then is, well, um, what do we do now? At the moment, the, the patent litigation system, which we are all used to, is still ongoing. We still have the situation where people bring infringement actions in Germany and we um, often look to um, revoke the patents in, in the United Kingdom. And that will continue. And indeed, that was going to continue with the UPC in place. Uh, but now what? Um, and I think there are, there are three options. Um, one is that uh, we carry on um, and ratify uh, with the uh, possibility, and in fact pretty much the knowledge, that we will then fall out of the court um, at the end of uh, when, when we actually do finally leave the European Union. Not very attractive for us. Uh, that the other 24 carry on with the UPC, that will require them to amend the agreement, and amending an international treaty is never easy. It may not also be that attractive, since it doesn't actually bring the attractions uh, that it would have done if it had involved the United Kingdom, but still, it's a large trading block. Possibly the other 24 will be interested in doing that. Difficult to say. Um, and the, the third option is that we find some way of being able to actually implement the UPCA, um, but again, that's going to require amendment. Um, it's going to require that uh, the United Kingdom, at least in this regard, accepts the primacy of the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union. Hard to see how that's going to be politically acceptable um, in the present circumstances. Um, and we will have to do something about the... Brussels regulation, which underlay the UPCA in terms of the mutual recognition of the judgments of the uh, UPC. So, all pretty difficult. Um, at the moment, not very clear what's going to happen next. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maureen. And next we have Richard Vary, who was Head of Litigation at Nokia. And he's going to talk about what's going to happen about fan disputes. Do we have some slides? Oh, there we are. Yes. 
<laughs> so, Fran litigation and Brexit. Um, the program makes it sound like I'm presently unemployed, former head of litigation at Nokia. Um, I am at least employed and not, uh, as David Rosenberg asked me at the start of the talk, uh, by Bristow's. <laughs> so... <laughs> the problem with Fran litigation today is there are just too many patents in too many countries. I once worked out that if I wanted to sit down and read Nokia's standard essential patent portfolio alone, it would take me into the year 2057. And that, that is simply the issue. You cannot sue on all of the patents in all of the countries that you need to in order to collect a, a friend royalty, a reasonable royalty on all of them. Um, there have been some creative ideas. I know Mr Justice Burse has talked in the Unwired Planet case uh, about that perhaps if one patent in a portfolio is found valid and infringed and essential, then that might be worth more um, than if you were to take, it as a, take a license to the portfolio as a whole. And that might be one way of looking at it. And I've talked at previous conferences about the idea of perhaps having some sort of copyright tribunal approach to these millions of FRAND SEPs because they're becoming rather like copyrights in the music industry. There are, there are too many of them to, to deal with uh, one at a time. But the reality is that the balance has been maintained for the last 10 years and is still being maintained by, by the threat of the injunction. What the patentee does is he goes and offers a license to all of his portfolio on, on what he says is FRAND terms. Um, and a recent twist in this is that now he also offers uh, arbitration. If you don't agree that my number is FRAND, then let's go and arbitrate over what uh, FRAND is. Um, and if the, the infringer, the licensee, uh, refuses, the patent owner sues, and he argues that his opponent's an unwilling licensee, and he seeks an injunction, some sort of injunctive relief. And the place where he does this, generally, is Germany. Yes, we have cases here, we have unwired planets uh, that is going on right now, but for every three unwired planet patents that are being litigated in the UK courts, there are 300 being litigated in the German courts. And the reason for that um, is simply speed. So here's a, a cartoon I have from Süddeutsche Zeitung about Brexit, which you can read while I tell you a little more about speed. So why is it Germany? It's not because it's pro-patent. That is uh, a common belief. The Federal Patent Court, to be honest, is one of the toughest courts in the world when it comes to validity. Is it the bifurcated system? In theory, yes. If you can get yourself through to an infringement decision uh, and not have the patent stayed and have nobody look particularly closely at the validity, then in theory, yes, that gives the patentee a serious advantage. But of the 150 patents that I litigated at Nokia in Europe, 73 of them we took to trial, and I can only think of one situation where there was an injunction given in Germany on a patent that was later found to be invalid. And it didn't matter because the finding of invalidity came later that day. So in practice, it didn't have that effect. But the reason that Germany was the first choice, the reason why it always features top of the litigation plan, is, like this cartoon, schnell, speed. And that's because in most FRAN disputes between most major patent holders, both sides have patents, both sides are going to sue each other, and you're in a race. You're in a race to get to some sort of a remedy. And this was illustrated back in 2010 uh, when uh, Nokia and Apple were in patent litigation. Now, if you can cast your minds back to 2010, this is a somewhat difficult scenario to imagine now. But Nokia was the largest mobile phone manufacturer in the world with 40% of the market, and Apple had 4% of the market. Difficult to imagine. Apple sued Nokia first in Europe. It sued in Dusseldorf, and it sued in the UK. It sued on nine patents in Dusseldorf, nine patents in the UK, quite a big uh, patent action. Nokia countersued with only five patents, but it sued in Mannheim. All five of the Mannheim cases were due to come to trial before any of Apple's cases in Dusseldorf or the UK. The first one went quite well. Apple settled. It was all about speed. The, one, the first one to get to trial was the one who won. So this is what the, the race basically looks like today. Mannheim, or Dusseldorf, or Munich, Munich increasingly today, is the hare racing towards the line. It's got an eye glancing backwards at the, the federal patent court, the wise old owls, because if it thinks they're going to invalidate the patent, it will stay. It's also looking backwards at the tortoise, the Italian tribunale, to see if they've, 
see if they've launched a torpedo. If they've launched a torpedo, then the hare has to sit and wait until the tortoise decides that it doesn't have jurisdiction. They're looking back at the bulldog, the English court. If the bulldog gets to the line first, if it decides that the patent is invalid, then the Mannheim court or the Munich court will take notice of that. There is a German Supreme Court case, the Volzenform Gubungsmaschine case, uh, which tells the German courts that they have to take notice of the decisions of other English, sorry, other EPC member states. That's fine. We have the, uh, the French court, the cockerel, who is strutting very slowly but elegantly. It wants to arrive fashionably late. But high above all of these, and almost as fast as the hare, is the American bald eagle. In this case, the International Trade Commission. The US district courts are too slow to really be of much use. And at the moment, their uh, approach to injunctions makes them effectively useless uh, in, in these battles. But the US ITC is as fast, almost. Um, but it has one great, well, it has two great advantages. First of all, as it is pretty secure in its own jurisdiction. It is not interested in what anybody else is doing. Mannheim is a town in Pennsylvania. Um, but the second great advantage it has is that it is ruling over a jurisdiction with 300 million consumers. That's as big as all of these other ones combined. If you can get an exclusion order in the US ITC, then that has as much impact as anything in, anything in Europe or all of these. Now, we had coming the new Unitary Patent Court, um, Unified Patent Court, the Unitary Patent. And that was going to give us a significant advantage. That was going to give us a court that was almost as fast as the Eagle and with a jurisdiction of more consumers than, than the US ITC. But then along came Brexit. And that's rather thrown a spanner in the works. As far as I can see, there are three things that might happen from here. We might have no UPC at all. The hare, the tortoise, the bulldog, the eagle, the cockerel, they'll all con continue their race in exactly the same way as they have been before. We might have a UPC, which includes the UK. It's an unlikely possibility, but there is uh, a move, an opportunity, to have the UPC to include all EPC member states, and it is one that is being pushed and ar ar argued for. There are others who think that's highly unlikely. Um, the UK government is probably never going to accept a, a court system which has at its heart the CJEU, but it's going to be difficult to persuade Europe to ditch the CJEU from the UPC. So maybe that won't happen. The third possibility is the UPC going ahead without the UK. Now, that in some ways sounds like the worst of all worlds for us. It's the one with the greatest risk for FRAND-related patent litigation. The UPC covers a much greater market. The UK, if it's slower than the UPC, if the UPC is covering uh, so many more countries, why, why would you file your patent infringement case in the UK anymore? And not just that. Your portfolio managers of these companies, they're managing portfolios of 30,000, 40,000 patents. The renewal fees are significant. The validation fees are significant. They are highly selective in which countries they validate in. Typically, they'll validate all of them in the US. They'll validate some in the UK, or sorry, most of them in Germany. They'll validate some in the UK, some in China, some in India, some in the other big countries. But the UPC, if it's more expensive to validate your patents, they're going to come under pressure to cut some other countries. It might be that the UK is one of the ones that they choose to cut back on. And that's a pretty dismal future for us. But there is another side to this story. There is an alternative. Rather like this laptop, the UPC <laughs> is going to move rather more slowly. We fed the hare with a number of procedures that we have in the UK. We fed him with expert reports. We fed him with a case management conference, an interim case management conference on the way. We fed him with a form of discovery uh, and witness statements. All of the things that are going to slow him down a little, make him fat. It doesn't take an awful lot of Im imagination. It doesn't take an awful lot of refinement of UK procedures for the bulldog to be rather quicker, for the bulldog to get to the finishing line first. And that changes the scenario completely. If the UK is faster than the UPC, it becomes the jurisdiction of choice. If somebody sues you with the UPC, you sue them back in the UK first. Yes, your injunction, your result is going to cover far fewer people, but you'll get it before the other one. So there is the opportunity that we have if we find ourselves left out of the UPC. We can make ourselves a little quicker, we can make ourselves a little leaner, 
and it doesn't take much before we become the Mannheim of today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, once I've managed to negotiate my way out. Um, so now for a change of <laughs> subject matter. Um, I'm going to talk about trademark and design issues and end up at the end of my 10 minutes in considering what rights owners might consider doing now in preparation for Brexit. As you all know, um, EU trademarks and registered community designs are unitary rights, providing protection across the EU. And unless arrangements are put in place on Brexit, they will cease to cover the EU, the, the UK. Although it would be possible to file on Bre Brexit trademarks in the UK, the danger is that because the trademark will lose its priority date, it will no longer be registrable if third parties have snuck in there and acquired intervening national rights. And in relation to registered designs, you're in a worse position. You can't simply refile because if your, your design is older than 12 months old, uh, by, it will no longer be novel and you can no longer refile. So we've got to find some sort of solution to this problem. For <clears throat> After all, rights owners have paid for these rights to cover the whole of the EU, including the UK. And if the government does not do something, it could be liable for deprivation of property under the EU Convention on Human Rights. So I'm first going to consider trademarks. And here is a slide which I have s stolen with subtle daring from the ITMA website. May look like a bit of a colorful patchwork quilt to those at the back for which I apologize. But it's uh, showing the different options which are being considered at the moment. The first one at the top is, I think, highly unlikely. Uh, it's a system which would allow for um, a, a, a European-wide trademark system where the UK, as a non-member state, could participate on the same basis as member states. I mean, politically, that's not going to happen. Therefore, I think one of the schemes uh, further down the list uh, for bringing trademarks onto the UK register, either automatically or on an application, may well be the way to go. Uh, these have been called Montenegro and Tuvalu. Uh, th these names are not plucked out of thin air. Um, they actually are the sorts of systems were, which were adopted by these countries uh, in the case of Montenegro uh, when it split from Serbia and in the case of Tuvalu, Tuvalu when it se separated from the UK. Now, although these two systems would be easy to implement and ensure legal certainty, there are concerns about them, uh, particularly if the UK um, just adopted the trademarks uh, from the EU. Um, there would be concerns about cluttering of the register and that some marks will be invalid in the UK but nevertheless will go on to the register automatically. Therefore, there have been discussions about putting trademark owners through some additional hoops, um, either on the point where the trademark is converted to a UK trademark or perhaps on first renewal. The issue here is mainly one of uncertainty for the trademark owner. The trademark owner is really going to be concerned about what is going to have happen to their mark. They need to know that it's going to be accepted. Don't want to be concerned about whether the specification will be found to be too broad or the mark not inherently registrable in the UK. Or possibly there would be the thorny issue that the UK IPO would demand uh, filing evidence of use. So I think in summary, it looks as if certainly recommendations are being made for the Montenegro or the Tuvalu solution. 
And here's another slide, which again, um, although annotated, um, I stole from the IPMAR website. And I do actually recommend that you look at it. There's an awful lot of information, um, very useful it is too, on that site. Um, registered designs essentially uh, will be treated very much like registered European trademarks. But the more interesting question when it comes to designs is what's going to happen to unregistered designs? Unregistered design regimes in the EU and in the UK protect slightly different aspects of the design. So unregistered community designs protects the whole or part of a 2D or 3D design, whereas in the UK an unregistered design protects the shape or configuration of a de design but excludes its surface decoration. Now the UK's unregistered design is quite popular because of its flexibility and therefore the easiest way to preserve the status quo will probably be to create a UK style um, unregistered community design right which sits alongside the UK unregistered design. And if you're worried about transitional periods, well, the community unregistered design is only a, a right that lasts for three years, and so it will only be brief. I think this is much easier than trying to amend existing laws and preferably uh, reverting to, well, so either that, uh, creating existing laws, or reverting to the present law and relying upon that in copyright. Then we need to consider the issue of enforcement issues uh, on Brexit. The UK High Court will cease to be an EU trademark court or a registered community design court and cease to have jurisdiction over EU trademarks and registered community designs. Obviously, this is going to affect ongoing trademark and design infringement proceedings both in the UK court and in the courts of other member states where they would normally expect if they asked for pan-European uh, injunctive relief for it to cover the, the UK as well. And this will need to be sorted, obviously, with transitional provisions. But one thing we shouldn't forget is what happens to all those in existing injunctions which have already been granted by courts in the EU um, on Brexit. Will they automatically be converted to EU plus UK? Or will uh, the parties have to seek leave? And inevitably, that's going to open a complete can of worms as one party or the other says, well, it's not relevant in this jurisdiction uh, or in the, um, in the UK or in the EU. Uh, now, now we're coming to consider it again. And then there are other um, issues and options that we need to consider. First of all, what's going to happen to the new uh, trademark directive? Um, as you know, um, a new recast trademark directive was adopted in December of last year, and national governments have three years to implement it. At the moment, we've got an odd situation where the regulation, uh, the back-to-back -back regulation covering EU trademarks is already in force, and it makes no sense, really, to leave the UK Trademarks Act dangling. And the word on the street is that the government is going to get on with it and will amend that. And then there's the issue of free movement of goods and exhaustion of rights. That's a really thorny one. I was asked to address it, though. Um, at the moment, of course, we have EEA-wide um, exhaustion of trademarks and design rights, it, as it has been called Fortress Europe. Once the UK is no longer part of the EEA, of course, we'll be thrown out. We will be outside the fortress, um, no longer have free movement of goods. Um, that's a really political hot potato, and I'm not going to speculate on that one. But in the UK, I feel a little bit more comf confident. What's going to happen? Uh, what sort of exhaustion are we going to adopt? Is it going to be UK-wide or international exhaustion? My money, I have to say, is on international exhaustion. As many of you will remember, in the early days of the Trademark Directive, uh, they rejected the principle of international exhaustion. And despite Mr. Justice Laddie in the Zeno Davidov case having another try, that attempt failed. And that, of course, will, if we do adopt it, benefit um, consumers, but uh, will be uh, anxious making, I think, for trademark owners. So, my final topic um, is. 
uh, making a few recommendations as to do uh, as to what to do um, in this period of uncertainty. I know it's very dangerous to be a prognosticator, but here goes. In relation to trademarks, I don't think that you have to rush to refile all your EU trademarks in the UK now. But certainly, you could deal with the uncertainty by considering obtaining UK trademark registrations for your most important marks. This will enable you to get around all those worries about what will happen in the interregnum if you need to assert them. Um, you don't need to wait on government decisions. Uh, you will be safe in asserting them in the UK. Um, and this is actually backed up by looking at uh, trademark filings. Um, this year, they're higher in the UK um, IPO uh, than in any previous uh, five or six years. Oh, and if you do have useful trademark, UK trademarks on the register, don't let them lapse. In relation to designs, registered designs, similar issues uh, in relation to uh, trademarks, although do remember uh, you won't be able to convert your registered design. You can't just uh, file for a registered design um, without, um, uh, if, if it's less than two, um, less than 12 months old, uh, because if you do so, uh, you're just going to have a design that's useless. It lacks novelty. But... Uh, in relation to unregistered designs, um, you need to consider to what extent the business relies upon surface decoration. Uh, do you need to actually undergo a limited uh, registration program um, at the moment? And on registered designs, do you need to be doubling up now, so applying both in the EU and in the UK? So there are a few thoughts. And um, while uh, you consider those, we can wait for the government to negotiate what's actually going to happen. Thank you very much. And uh, now we have uh, Simon Thorley, QC, who doesn't need to be introduced to anyone who's involved in IP, uh, and is from the home team now, uh, Brickcore Chambers. More or less from the home team, I noticed that I was making my notes with a bird and bird barro, <laughs> stolen from. Uh, I'm going to talk first about supplementary protection certificates, and then I'm going to amplify a little bit on what Morag uh, and Richard said about the UPC. Supplementary protection certificates were introduced into our law by way of European EU regulations starting in 1993. Their object is to compensate patentees for the period of patent protection which is lost by reason of delays inherent in obtaining regulatory approval to market a new drug. <coughs> the research-based pharmaceutical companies consider SPCs to be a vital tool for helping them to recover the vast cost of uh, research and development and carrying out clinical trials. Generic pharmaceutical companies obviously view matters in a somewhat different light. Uh, be that as it may, SBCs granted under the regula relevant regulations are given effect in this country under the Patents Act. It cannot, I fear, be said that the regulations are a model of clear drafting. And as a result, there have been a number of references to the CJEU for clarification, which some might think has resulted in precisely the opposite. Indeed, as recently as July this year, Mr. Justice Arnold, a judge perhaps not lacking in a measure of judicial self-confidence, <laughs> felt constrained to refer yet another question to the CJEU. This is... 20-something years later, one might have thought by now the CJEU could have been kind enough to tell us what they think it meant, but they haven't. So, post-Brexit, what are the options open to the UK to provide the desired national protection? I think we need to consider transitional provisions and then uh, provisions for when we have left the EU. Transitional provisions seem pretty straightforward. 
you've got to continue to give effect to the regulation pursuant to which an SPC was granted before we come, came out of the EU. Uh, but obviously we shall not thereafter have the ability to seek guidance from the CJEU. But a question does arise is the extent to which we should give account to decisions of the CJEU with a view to maintaining harmony. And this aspect will also be at the forefront of decisions on a post-Brexit UK SPC. First of all, do we want one at all? The generics will, of course, argue hard for no answer. David Rosenberg might not agree. He's shaking his head. I'm not sure whether that means he agrees or doesn't agree. <laughs> if there is to be one, should it mirror the somewhat unsatisfactory language of the regulation? Uh, I was talking the other day to Andrew War QC, and I think he would have an apoplectic fit if that was a suggestion. Should it extend beyond that which is currently protected in, say, the field of medical devices, which require a medical device certificate? At present, it doesn't. But there are still delays in getting that certificate, uh, which uh, ought necessarily to be compensated for. This may be an opportunity to create a user-friendly, clear, simple and efficient system, which the current regulations have failed to do. The Swiss have created a parallel law which mirrors the EU approach, and this may well provide a starting point, but we shouldn't underestimate the scale of the task. There are other matters which will have to be addressed. London is the home of the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, which employs over a thousand people in Canary Wharf. Will it stay here? Italy, Denmark and Sweden have already staked a claim to it. Further, under the centralised marketing authorisation system, which requires companies to submit a single application to the EMA to obtain a community marketing authorisation valid in all EU and EEA countries, about a third of the applications are outsourced to our Medicines and Healthcare Product Regulations Agency. Can this continue, or is this going to be uh, a further loss of business? The simple solution, of course, is for the UK to become a member of the EEA, but politically this may not be possible. Can I turn to the UPC? One of the consequences of my ceasing practice at the bar and now leading a life of penury and darning on my meagre pension <laughs> is that I can't afford <laughs> is that I can't afford to buy the rose colored spectacles that many proponents of the UPC appear to have purchased over recent months I would love to see it succeed it's not quite the court that Robin Jacob and I naively uh, envisaged in 1996 when we first took part in discussions on the topic. But a thriving unified court makes good sense. Should we, should we ratify? Can we ratify? You've already heard from Morag that ratification by the UK is a prerequisite of it coming into effect. There is actually an antecedent to this that we have under Article 8 of the Statute of the UPC to ratify a protocol on privileges and immunities. That protocol is only open for uh, ratification until the 29th of June next year. Therefore, we can't sit on our backsides and do nothing. It's got, we've got to have a yes-no by then. And it is provided that that protocol cannot come into force unless France, Germany, Luxembourg and the UK have all ratified. France and Luxembourg have, Germany and the UK have not. I understand, and that's shorthand for saying I'm not entirely certain but I believe what I'm saying is about to be right, that the protocol cannot be ratified by the UK without primary legislation. Are the government going to allow a bill to go before both Houses of Parliament which indirectly allows debate on the acceptability of primacy of, UK, of EU law? 
I rather think they won't. And so even before one gets to shall we ratify the UPCA, one's got to think about that. Now, what happens if we don't ratify? The UPCA as it exists can't go forward. There would have to be some form of renegotiation. But Article 36 of the current agreement requires that the court be self-financing after an initial period. We all thought that was a pretty tall order, even with the UK taking part. I don't think I'm being arrogant in suggesting that participation of UK lawyers and judges in proceedings of the court was one of its selling points. Much of the judicial training of potential judges has been carried out by UK judges and lawyers. I anticipate the court will be less attractive without the UK with inevitable financial consequences. So, for these reasons also, I fear that if we don't ratify, that will be the death knell for the UPC. If we do ratify, obviously everything is fine for two years. Large sums of money will be spent equipping the court in Aldgate. Judges and staff will be appointed. Jobs will be obtained by UK residents and so on. But what happens then? One thing I'm absolutely certain of is that if there is some scope for negotiating a, a part for the UK in a UPC, is that the EU will not allow EU courts, whether national courts of member states or pan-European courts, surrendering jurisdiction to foreign courts, which we would then become, unless there is a guarantee that EU law and constitutional principles apply. Supremacy of EU law would have to be accepted. This would not only include accepting rulings of the CJEU on interpretation of the UPCA, but also applying EU competition law, the biotech directive, the SPC laws, and much more concerning, any future laws which the EU were minded to enact over which we would have no control. As a result, sadly, I have grave concerns that one of the no doubt wholly unforeseen consequence of the Brexit vote, I don't suppose UKIP were focusing greatly upon the UPCA, but one of the consequences will be its demise. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And now, finally, uh, we have the privilege of having Mr. Justice Henry Carr, who's going to talk about or make predictions about the futures of pat future of patent litigation in London. So um, I should begin by explaining that uh, as a judge, all other judges and myself uh, don't wish to express our personal views on the uh, wisdom or otherwise of Brexit. Uh, which leaves me with the option of saying absolutely nothing for 10 minutes and making it appear relevant. Well, I did quite a lot of that at the bar, and I, <laughs> I do see barristers doing it very well in front of me now, so it's a possibility. <laughs> However, w what I thought I would do is to um, look at it, first of all, from the point of view of the optimists, think we have a bright future post-Brexit, and then the pessimists. So. I have um, heard it said, uh, well, I have been told by several members of the profession that they voted for Brexit, and the reason why they voted for Brexit was because they wished to preserve our system. You know, if you spend all these years learning how to cross-examine, you don't want to stop doing it, nor do you wish to uh, give up the uh, fat fees on large trials. And the argument goes, well, you know, we're a very big economy, people aren't going to stop taking pills, you know, it's a huge market and people are going to uh, buy lots of mobile phones, so you have to sue here. Uh, the pessimists would say there are two problems with that uh, uh, view. 
The first, which um, Richard Vary has uh, pointed out, is a very simple one, which is that no one has ever sued everywhere. You look for an early decision in key jurisdictions, and then you settle. So the, the argument you have to sue in the UK, say the pessimist, simply isn't right. Secondly, there is a much more complex point, which I'll try and briefly explain, but which those who are interested in patents should be aware of. Uh, the um, Brussels recast regulation was amended to take account of the UPC by regulation 542-2014. And in that regulation, there is a provision which, where the drafters turn their mind to the case where you have a European patent and there is infringement of the European patent outside UPC territory. What can the UPC do? Well, that's covered in Article 71. And Article 71B, and I paraphrase, effectively says the UPC does have jurisdiction over extraterritorial infringements of a European patent, subject to two conditions. One is that uh, the defendant must have property in the uh, uh, relevant, in a, in a member state contracting state of the UPC. And secondly, that uh, the dispute must have a sufficient connection with the jurisdiction in which uh, the company has property. And if, if we look at that now from a, a UK perspective, let's say uh, a German company is suing, in Germ is suing in the UPC for infringement by distribution in Germany. And let's say, for example, the relevant products are being manufactured in the UK. Well, and let's also say that the UK company has a patent, a European patent, which extends to Germany. Well, says the German company, I'm just going to add to my claim in the UPC, a claim for infringement in the UK, get my injunction there as well. If that happens, uh, say the pessimists, difficult to see why anyone should bother with the UK. Now, there are two possible answers to that. One answer is we join the Lugano Convention, in which case we are protected from that provision. I can see that. That might take some time. The second answer is that certain litigants may wish to apply for declarations of non-infringement in the UK, a kind of race, to use uh, Richard's example of the, uh, the hare, the tortoise, and all the other creatures, a race to the court. And maybe uh, people will apply for um, pan-European declarations of non-infringement, which, of course, um, Miss Justice Arnold granted and... Uh, it, it, his jurisdictional views were upheld by the Court of Appeal in the um, Eli Lilly and uh, activist case. That's a possibility. Um, I just wanted to say a few thoughts about uh, uh, comments on a few points the other speakers made. First of all, I, I, I'm not, I don't know the word is pessimistic, I, I'm not as sure that we won't ratify the UPC as the other speakers. We need to remember it's an international treaty and it has been said to me that one way of the government showing that we are an outward-looking nation that wishes to uh, trade is to ratify this international agreement. It's certainly not impossible. Secondly, I'm not convinced that if we do ratify, we will then be kicked out, uh, uh, provided we don't voluntarily decide to leave, because there is an enormous amount of goodwill amongst uh, uh, the other uh, states, the UPC, uh, towards the UK. Um, somebody has touched on the fact that they really, really want to have the UK judges involved, uh, um, probably my colleagues uh, who've done rather more than me at the moment, but they certainly want us involved. Often people say how absolutely fantastic it is to have UK advocates in, in the CJU and other and uh, international courts, and they really want us. And therefore, I think that if we do ratify, a momentum will build up and we will stay. Um, I think, finally, I should say that um, uh, um, I think that the uh, UPC will go on without us. I, I don't uh, uh, quite see it from the point of view that Simon Thorley does, because if we don't ratify, many European countries want to show that they can do this without us. And to many parts of industry, it's quite attractive. 
Finally, um, on uh, uh, Richard's point about speed, I completely agree with it that if we wish to have a thriving and attractive jurisdiction, we're going to need to speed up. How are we going to do that? Well, I think we're going to have to think quite radically. One option is to consider, should we adopt for the most, the biggest, most complicated cases in the High Court, effectively an IPEC model, where trials take two days, uh, disclosure is either non-existent or very limited, cross-examination is not a lot of it, uh, and, uh, and so on, and it comes on quickly. Well, many would say, but how can you do that? I think I would probably say some of the complex cases I've heard I'd find very difficult, but I would just observe that everybody else in Europe seems to do it and get an answer within a day and a half, or perhaps a day. If we wish to, we can do it too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, now, our five speakers have, I think, raised enough questions to occupy all the rest of you for the rest of the session. Uh, so it's now over to you. And uh, who would like to speak? Mr. Justice On. Right. Give, it, give him a microphone, someone. I hope I will be forgiven as judge in charge of the Patents Court for responding to the comments that have been made about speed. And <laughs> I, I will just make three points. Firstly, today the Court of Appeal gave judgment in the Knapp and Dr. Reddy's case, which was a case which went from claim form to decision of the Court of Appeal in five and a half months. That's not one instance, that's two instances of a patent infringement action in, I repeat, five and a half months. Secondly, don't forget we have available to us the shorter trial scheme. This morning I heard a pre-trial review of a patent case under the shorter trial scheme. So that is a way in which people can get patent actions on more quickly, even without the benefit of expedition. Thirdly, do not forget that even in large and heavy cases, if expedition is warranted, it can be ordered. And I would instance, by way of many examples, the Idenex and Gilead case, which was one of the most uh, complex patent cases I've tried since I've been on the bench, and it came on for trial in precisely seven months. So we can expedite cases and hear them quickly already, and we do. Thank you. Who next? I was going to offer a little bit of information for uh, <coughs> Mr. Thorley. Um, I understand that eight countries have submitted to be the new head, the new location for the EMA. The EMA has already heard submissions from three, I think last week, um, one of them's Poland, that was uh, last week. Um, and the Paul Ehrlich Institute has offered to take up the slack when the MHRA vacates. Whether that'll happen or not, it's all uh, my understanding. Hmm. No one else? Jemima. I'll, I'll fill in the gap um, by, I found Richard's presentation on FRAND and the, the problem of speed um, fascinating and, and totally agree with all of that. But I wonder whether there are other issues that make uh, the UK not the most attractive jurisdiction which we would also need to think about and which may not all be particularly Brexit focused and I have in mind in particular the fact that it's seemed, it, as I understand it it's much more easy or possible in Germany to get a finding in relation to a whole portfolio of patents than it appears to be currently in the UK. Now of course we have as far as the UK is concerned, a vaguely historic moment in FRAN litigation in that we do have the first FRAN uh, action which has actually gone to trial, the On My Planet case, which is being heard by Mr Justice Burst at the moment, as you, as you mentioned, and it may be that that will cast some further light on that question, and it may be that the position is more optimistic than I suggest, but surely for... for patent holders, unless they can 
have a realistic prospect of obtaining a ruling which helps them in relation to a, their portfolio, which is what they re they're really interested in in commercial terms, the UK remains an unattractive forum. One um, of the problems we're facing, or we're fighting, is that industry's impression of the courts is always about five years out of date. Um, and I lose track of the number of times I, uh, people say to me, why on earth would you recommend suing in the UK? That's just the patent graveyard. They'll find it invalid or not infringed. Um, I don't even know why we're bothering, and it'll cost two million per patent. There's that, that's the image um, that, that we have at the moment, and it's, it's, it's well out of date. And as uh, Mr Justice Arnold pointed out, we can move quickly. And that's the reputation that needs to get out there. I think we've got over the reputation of being the patent graveyard. Most, many people I... I speak to now understands that the UK is not the place it once was in that in that sense. And if we can get a reputation for speed too. Um, as far as the German courts hearing portfolio claims, I, I don't actually think they do. They, in a slightly perfunctory way, they will look at whether an offer is franned and they will look at an offer that covers a whole portfolio. It doesn't anymore have to be a single patent offer, which it did have to be a few years ago. But it really is a box ticking exercise. Is it an offer? Yes, well, you know. They, they don't go into any analysis. Back in 2006, we did try and bring a case, sorry, 2007, that we did try and bring a case before the Mannheim Court for a declaration that a, a particular offer was friend. The Mannheim Court and then the Karlsruhe Court of Appeal found increasingly ingenious ways not to make a decision on the point. Um, whereas now we, we have the possibility of a UK court doing exactly that. So I, I'm not sure I would say that the German courts are more ready than ours to make a decision on what's portfolio friend. I've, I found them less. Um, yes, just, just to, uh, is, is it working? Yes. J just to comment on um, Jemima's point, um, it is true that um, currently uh, Colin Burse is hearing the um, Unwired Planet First Fran trial here. Um, the only thing is it's going to take seven weeks of court time. Now, this, as I understand it, is because of various competition defences, etc. But if we wish to remain competitive, we have to really think about that one, I think. Can't Fran hearings be done a lot more simply, maybe set the royalty rate and for the portfolio and hive off competition issues to another day? Because my experience is that once you've set a rate, or e uh, the whole thing settles. But uh, I don't know whether the millions of pounds that are going to be spent on this massive trial will make us uh, more attractive than even a perfunctory view in Germany. That's it. We obviously sort it all out then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question then. The, um, I mean, all of this is very depressing, essentially, and I like to think of myself as um, a man, someone who likes a sort of glass half full kind of attitude. Is there any actual benefit to Brexit? What does the panel, can the panel think of anything that can we fix the IP law on the way? Is there is there any benefit to doing this? Um, I think there's one enormous benefit to Brexit that no longer will we have to go to the CJEU. Uh, in my experience at the bar, uh, businessmen want a decision as quickly and as cheaply as they can commensurate with the obtaining of justice. And a reference to the CJEU bogs everything down um, Nick said to me the other day that it was 18 months. My experience is it's rather longer. And in IP litigation, uncertainty is uh, a very valuable weapon in the hand of the patentee. It's an enormous obstruction to uh, free trade uh, of a potential infringer if they haven't got a clue whether they're going to infringe or not. And I have on occasions had a client, have clients who've said to me, can we have a de decision quickly? I don't mind if I lose as long as I lose quickly. Because then I can make business plans as to how to set my business up uh, knowing the future. So I think that is a possible benefit of Brexit that we shall no longer have these, um, dare I say, slightly opaque 
decisions coming <laughs> down from Luxembourg? There you are, there's something. Yeah. Yes. Um, just to answer your point, Simon, yes, I do want an SPC type system in the I UK. Thought okay. you, I thought you might, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just touching on another point, exhaustion. As I understand, and I'm still relatively young, as I understand exhaustion law before we came into the EU, it was largely developed by the judges using IP as a tool either to allow or not to allow parallel trade. And I, I would argue that it's an economic decision for the government as to whether we have regional exhaustion, national exhaustion, or international exhaustion. They need to make that decision consciously, and it shouldn't be left to the judges, with great respect to the judges here, because it really is an economic policy decision. And it shouldn't be based on, is it the essential function of a trademark to prevent the genuine goods coming in? That is not the way this decision should be made. So if the government is going to think about any of these things in detail, I would argue this is quite an important issue. Well, I, I, I'd just like to respond that I wholeheartedly agree with David on I, th I think he's completely correct. It is a policy decision for government and government should take it. Unfortunately, however, government has a habit of not taking these decisions, mm -hmm. in which case the judges have to. I agree, but the point is being made to the IPO now that it is a government policy decision. Whether they will take the point is a different issue. Robin? Well, in relation to um, parallel imports, some governments in the past did do. So New Zealand looked at everything and said, right, well, since we don't make anything, <laughs> <laughs> we will have international exhaustion so our people can buy stuff the cheapest wherever it is. Um, uh, and that's a perfectly rational thing to do. And you get various professors who come along uh, and opine. You get companies, people like NAP, and, and they produce reports. You'll never get anything useful out of any of those at all. Um, easy in New Zealand's case, not so easy in Australia's case. They also made a policy decision. But uh, there is another side to it, too. You're a patentee. You own a patent all over the world. Can you not say where the things going under your patent are going? So it may be different for copyright, trademarks, uh, and patents. But don't rely on the government making any rational policy decision. <laughs> 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 One other thing I just wanted to add. It, it, it's strange, uh, I, as many of you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be in, in charge of the committee doing the pre-selection of judges. And uh, just as a little story, the day after Brexit, I got a phone call from the patent office saying, oh, you're due to be going to Sweden next week. You can go if you like. We're not going to pay you. We're not coming. But since we've already paid for your hotel and your, and, and, and your fare, you can go if you want to. <laughs> On Monday, they said, we're coming, and we will get paid. And they've carried on, as though absolutely nothing has happened at all. Uh, that may be interesting as regards um, what they're going to do by way of ratification. They're certainly keeping them th themselves in the position where they can. I, I feel maybe, on the other hand, a bit like Donald Duck running off the edge of a cliff, and you keep keeping on running until you look down. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to... Uh focus again on Nick's question of uh, possible benefits of Brexit, a little bit of creative thinking. So um, uh, uh, if you're a defendant, you don't like or will be unwise to like bifurcation. You want your validity attack at the same time as the patentee's infringement case. And you want them fairly quickly. Now, if we're not there, it may well be that the UPC uh, is dominated by Germany and becomes uh, a jurisdiction where there is bifurcation, in which case people may start more declarations of non-infringement and applications and actions for revocation here, uh, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I was trying my best and it's taking... One, one of the <laughs> effects of the arguments about the UPC and in, during the course of its creation is that the German judges are now largely persuaded that bifurcation is not a good idea. Mm. It's taken them a very long time to realize that because they had to have it and therefore that was the way it was. 
But now they've thought about it rather a lot, and I've heard several of them say, well, that's one of the things we got out of this. Uh, and even in the UPC, bifurcation is a very different thing from that in German courts. You don't decide to bifurcate until the pleadings are in, halfway through the case. The counterclaim's already there. The onus lies on the patentee to ask for bifurcation. Well, the only ground I can think of for asking a bifurcation is my patent's very weak, and unless I have bifurcation, I'll get, get it nowhere. You can't put that one forward. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a... Mm, not a good, it's not going to help. I wonder whether I could ask the, the, the panel about the prospects of uh, FRAN disputes going to arbitration, including an arbitration uh, with a power to grant injunction. Um, FRAN disputes are going to arbitration. Um, there have been at least, well, there's been one that I know of that's gone to a decision. Um, there have been at least three that I know of started. Um, uh, one has settled, one is still going. They, they, they've dealt with things rather more expeditiously than uh, we're dealing with them in Unwired Planet, um, in that the hearings have not been seven weeks. Um, they've been two weeks or so. Um, obviously, in arbitration, you have the advantage that an awful lot more is done in writing beforehand. Um, they, the prospect of an injunction hasn't occurred because in all cases what they're asking the, the tribunal to do is figure out what the, the cross-licensing uh, royalty should be, what the, yeah. what the balancing yeah. payment should be. So injunction, everybody surrendered their options to that by that point and it's just about money. And to be honest, that's on, on FRAND patents, that is all every, anybody is really seeking. Um, or certainly of the large patent owners, that is what they're seeking. They're just seeking a, a fair remuneration rather than injunction. Injunction doesn't help you because if you put your licensee off the market, he's not paying you anything. Because mm. London is a fairly popular place for arbitrations. Yes. And uh, therefore, it may be that uh, the effect of Brexit might be that more such cases go to arbitration in London. Yes, so far they have been... When you have a counterparty who is American, they won't countenance anything outside the United States because they don't recognize it as existing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we have that difficulty. So, so far they have either been in New York, we have, there's one in Paris, um, but the others, as far as I'm aware, have all been in the US. Right. But yes, the UK is a neutral jurisdiction with no major manufacturer headquartered here. Right. Um, first, a quick uh, point of information to follow up on the length of the Unwired Planet, what's been called the non-technical trial, and we do there have a very, a, a fairly exact um, example of the parallel in Germany because the German equivalent trial took, as I understand it, less than two weeks. So that, that's what we've got to recognise and think about and consider carefully, I suppose. Um, just coming back to, to Simon's point about the desirability of getting rid of the CJEU, uh, far be it for me to try and defend the Court of Justice <laughs> in this esteemed company, but um, thinking about pharmaceutical regulatory litigation, which is one of the areas I know better, uh, I would question how many of your disgruntled clients would still want to litigate here if they weren't going to be able, if, if, if you're thinking about clients who have the choice and in the pharmaceutical world there are clients who have obviously a pan-European business and are choosing just strategically where to litigate and where to have their, their issues determined, um, are they really going to want to have uh, decision even from our esteemed Supreme Court um, if a, another decision may come along from another EU country and result in a reference so it, it isn't going to give you certainty and it isn't going to give you a decision which has binding effect across the EU. I think when I made my observations I was thinking of infringement actions um, particularly thinking about 
arguments on the SPCs. I mean, Richard's recent judgment, he came to a conclusion as to what the SPC meant, uh, but felt constrained, and I can understand why, to refer it. Uh, if the position was that uh, Richard's judgment stood subject to anything the Court of Appeal said, uh, I suspect that it would be a major factor in seeking a settlement of the litigation that, that that was what had been said, because the alternative, obviously, is to go in another country. Uh, you then get the reference. And I think the thing that really frightens many businessmen is the total uncertainty as to what is going to come out of the CJEU. Uh, when I was in practice, I could have a rough guess as to how Sir Robin Jacob was thinking. <laughs> what? A very, very <laughs> rough <laughs> guess. <laughs> uh, I don't think any of us know what the politico-legal undercurrents are that are going through the CJEU at any one particular time. And so one has less ability to advise the clients as to what's going to happen. Uh, so I think there may still be attractions. I can see from a regulatory point of view that, that the considerations may be different. But from the way I was looking at it, I think there are advantages. Yes. Nobody else wants to say anything. Otherwise, I'm... I was just going to say one other sort of possible benefit of Brexit that I've thought of is that um, maybe not in relation to... It, SPCs and regulatory uh, decisions, but not having decisions from the CJU in relation to trademarks and what can and cannot be registered and what the grounds for infringement might actually lead to some certainty. And that might be a benefit, at least to trademark owners. Yes. Yes. Can I come back on that more and ask how much certainty do we expect? Uh, in the period when we don't know whether we're going to follow the existing judgments or not? <laughs> <laughs> Pass. <laughs> right, well, if there are no further offers, and this is your last chance, I'm not going to stand between you and your drinks. Uh, no? Can't see anyone. No. Very well. In that case, thank you very much to our panellists uh, and uh, thank you to all for coming along. And, uh